Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. What are you doing? We're still on vacation. Yeah, we kind of lied. <laughs> I don't know if we Lester. lied so much as we miscalculated. It, it might have just been yes, yeah, a miscalculation. It's not malicious. It's just we like these we vacations. Like vacations so much. Everything is <laughs> screwy. We worked so hard to record ahead, but we had to start recording ahead a lot earlier than the vacation actually started, and so that messed us up. That's what messed us up. Which means so everything seems not very timely. There are things. I'm not going to say what those things are. There are things that I know now that we should have talked about. 
long ago, but it'll appear like we're completely ignorant of those things. We're not. Like, did you hear that we landed on the moon? (laughs) We landed on the moon! (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so anyway, how are you doing? How are you feeling? I feel good. I feel great. I feel wonderful. I uh, I do too. And with that, uh, Andy, I think because we're so out of time and space, let's just get right to it. Let's do it. This is the next reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, the first in our epic disease film series with Charlton Heston in The Omega Man. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app or join us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And next week, we're going to have a lot of follow-up because we've been missing it now for three weeks. So uh, Steven's going to be back. Uh, Games Master Steven Smart's going to be back. And the Blot Spot's going to be back. And all those things are going to be back. But until then, Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. <laughs> Um, can I go first? Sure. <laughs> I only want to go first because yours is so funny. <laughs> That's right. I, I was actually surprised by mine. Um, it I, I hadn't heard of it. I hadn't heard it was coming. Uh, of course, by now it'll seem like old news. It is, uh, it's called War on Everyone. It comes from director John Michael McDonough, uh, who, who wrote and directed this film. Stars Alexander Skarsgård and Theo James and Tessa Thompson. It is a story of two corrupt cops in New Mexico who set out to blackmail and frame every criminal unfortunate enough to cross their path. It is... Uh, it, it, I picked it because the red band trailer made me laugh. This could be a terrible movie. I don't know. But these two guys seem really funny and super irreverent. And it's a complete id movie. And I can't wait for my id to be satisfied by it. John Michael McDonough uh, is, uh, he's actually somebody that we, uh, we've we talked about in terms of trailers before. Uh, he's the writer behind Calvary. 2014's Calvary. Um, he has al- also done uh, The Guard. He wrote The Guard and Ned Kelly and a short called The Second Death. Uh, I haven't seen any of those. Uh, he directed. This will be his fourth uh, feature film. I know you did. I know you did the Calvary trailer. I did. I did back. a Calvary trailer pick. I never saw it. Well, maybe you will after they do a trailer rewind on it. Rewind. I hope so. That's that's been good for me. Trailer rewinds. <laughs> But I, you know, I can't believe that you didn't even say Michael Pena of of the oh, cast. You're right. I mean, he's no, like I the totally one I'm most he, excited about. He is. He's a riot. He is. He is a riot. Uh, absolutely. And he's yes, he's perfect. Okay. So, he, what did you think of the movie overall? It. You know, I don't even know really what the story is about. <laughs> it just looks like it, it looks like the nice guys uh, in a more modern setting uh, and just kind of a darker, more irreverent sort of setting. Um, I loved the tone. I loved the vibe of these two uh, corrupt cops um, as they're, you know, trying to uh, blackmail these criminals and everything. And it just, I mean, I don't know. It just looked really funny. And just Michael Pena. I mean, this is like the sort of thing that I love Michael Pena uh, doing the most. I mean, he just is so stinking funny. And it looks like Paul Reiser actually pops up in the film, too, as the lieutenant, uh, which just (laughs) that makes me laugh, too. So, I, I mean... It's it's one of those ones where I feel like okay I I think I'm excited about it I kind of want to see um, something else uh, a, a full trailer to really get a handle on it especially because it seems so anachronistic to everything else that uh, John Michael McDonough has done yeah yeah this <laughs> is like, definitely a tonal change huge tonal shift so I, I'm very curious to see um, the next uh, trailer but right now I'm excited. I am too. It's it, you know, it's uh, it's just one of those that these guys are having just way too much fun doing a movie about cops that are high all the time, and I find that amusing. Uh, it, so mine comes out. Uh, let's see, it kicks off September thirtieth in the UK. Uh, actually, uh, it opened in Germany. Uh, at the Berlin International Film Festival in February, played South by Southwest uh, in March, uh, it, and uh, Chicago May 21st. So after the UK premiere in uh, September, I don't know uh, when else it's going to, you know, how its its worldwide release is going to be. It may be a direct-to-digital, that's not so great, but what are you going to do? What are you going to do? 
That's it. What's yours? Well, I, I have to say, mine is a movie I really, I kind of watched the, the trailer going, uh, I'm probably never going to pick this, and this is one I'm going to probably have to take the kids to, but I'm not going to really enjoy it. <laughs> and I watched the trailer, and I could not stop laughing. The trailer was so stinking funny. This is the trailer for the animated film coming out this September called Storks. Which, I, I mean, just everything about it just seemed so dumb, but I, I don't know. This is a, a story about these storks that have moved on from delivering babies to delivering packages. That's right. <laughs> so, but when an order for a baby appears, the best delivery stork must scramble to fix the error by delivering the baby. And, uh, oh man, I don't know. The lines in it, everything was just so funny. Andy Samberg is in it. Uh, Jennifer Aniston, Ty Burrell, Kelsey Grammer, uh, Kean Peel, Danny Trejo even pops up. Uh, just everything, it, it's got a really uh, great cast. It's directed by uh, Nicholas Stoller and Doug Sweetland, written by Nicholas Stoller. They uh, did kind of, I guess, the Neighbors. Well, Nicholas uh, Stoller did the uh, the Neighbors movies, Neighbors and Neighbors 2. Um, also for getting Sarah Marshall is where he got his start. Get him to the Greek five-year engagement. He wrote engagement. the Muppets, and or, yeah, and then as a writer, right? He wrote uh, he wrote the Muppets. I mean, it's real hit and miss. Yeah. Some of the stuff like Yes Man, Fun with Dick and Jane, but then Muppets and Muppets Most Wanted. But then Sex Tape, Zoolander's two. <laughs> it's yeah. real. Uh, but he's he's working on Captain Underpants right now, which uh, which could be a fun one because that's that is a, a fun little uh, uh, book series to read yeah, with the kids. Right. And uh, Doug Sweetland um, is definitely more the one who's in the animated world, um, having worked as an animator since Toy Story and starting like lead animator, supervising animator with Pixar like Cars, Ratatouille, somebody who's definitely done some more stuff. And he directed the Presto short, Mm -hmm. which I think might still be my favorite uh, Pixar short. I just, I can't get a, enough of that one. This trailer looks like it's got that sense of humor. It looks like it's somebody who has kind of had the the handle of some of the Pixar stuff. Um, I'm hoping that the Nicholas Stoller side of things is going to be some of the more, the funny stuff, the the Muppetsy sort of things. And I I really hope I uh, I end up loving this because I already just completely love the trailer. And I, I this is one that I, I already feel like I want to go back and watch this trailer like five more times. <laughs> I, I laughed progressively harder every 10 seconds. Like it just didn't stop and I, <laughs> until the end of the trailer. Um, it, it is it is really self-aware. It seems like just, I mean, maybe I'm just channeling dad humor and it's not funny to anybody else who isn't looking forward to taking their kids to this movie. I get it. But I'm going to go ahead and bathe in that feeling with this movie. Oh, yes. I can't wait. Oh, yes. It looks really, it's, really good. <laughs> it's going to be funny. Um, this movie does open in September. Uh, it's kind of like a huge worldwide release um, in September. Here in the U.S., September 23rd. And then a few spots, uh, Greece, Sweden, France, U.K., Italy, Germany. Uh, they'll be opening in October. And Andy Samberg, his, uh, he's a marketing genius. You know, pop star never stop, never stopping. I, I never made it to to see it in the theaters, but it did look uh, really funny, and I liked what what he and his group were doing with that uh, concept. Me too. I I love that in this movie he they they worked in that. Uh, you know, he's he's got like a little catchphrase. Weird as it is, when he when he says cool, 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 right? And they have him doing that as the bird. I think that's fantastic. That's his thing. It's going to be fun. Yeah, Andy. It's. Genuine 160-proof old Anglo-Saxon baby. The last man on earth lives in a fortress. What day is it anyway? Monday? The hell it is. It's Sunday. Sunday I always dress for dinner. The last man on earth always carries an automatic weapon. The last man on earth is hunting. Because the last man on earth is not alone. Right up against the wall, you mother. Uh-uh, don't turn and just stand. When I want you to turn, I'll turn you on or off, up or around, I'll turn you. Now cool it. Now put your hands out. Out. Way out. About shoulder, I'd like to go crucify you, baby. If you got any more questions, fathead. My name is Robert. Your name's Mud. Andy, uh, we're doing the Omega Man. And In retrospect, do you feel like we should have picked the last man on Earth? 
Yeah, or um, you know what this movie made me think? Oh, God, it made me think. How great was I Am Legend? Oh, wow. Yeah, I like it. It make me think that. This movie made me like I Am Legend by comparison. If I had to flick chart, I would flick chart the heck out of I Am Legend compared to this movie. You would tell me you wouldn't too. Come I don't on. know. I'd have to rewatch that one because I really, you I really disliked that one. Of your mind, I'm, you I'm not. I just have to. I, I just don't want to be hasty. Oh, I cannot wait to hear where we go on this movie. I cannot wait. <laughs> this is. The ridiculous Omega Man, the second adaptation of I Am Legend, the book, uh, which was dramatically better than all of the adaptations by Richard Matheson, um, and it is uh, just awful. Uh, Last Man on Earth story, everybody else catches a disease, and they all, all, uh, it seems like they, they all turn into, if they're black people, they turn into white people. If they're white people, they turn into even whiter people. They're making some sort of a cockamamie statement on race in this film. Stars Charlton Heston. He's terrible. This movie will make you, make you hate Charlton Heston. I'm a walking Amazon review, Andy. You, you sound like one. Terrible. <laughs> this I said last week. I said this is a movie that, or this is a, a gen, generally a a genre of these sort of disease movies. Yep. That I am very fond of, and this movie made me question that fondness. <laughs> it's like questioning your uh, um, your childhood love of Children of the Corn all over again. Terrible. Directed by Boris Segal. Uh, produced by Walter Seltzer, based on, as we said, I Am Legend by Richard Matheson, starring Charlton Heston, Anthony Zerby, Rosalind Cash, music by Ron Grainer, cinematography, Russell Meddy. We're going to talk about all those. I can't believe it. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. It's a, it is a, uh, it, it's not a good movie. <laughs> it's not a good movie. Um. There's something that, I don't know, there's something, there's like a 70s cheese about it, though, that I feel like I can I, I can get it why some people would say, oh, this is one of my favorites. Like Tim Burton says this is like one of his favorites. If it's on, he just can't help but sit there and watch the whole thing. There is this level of 70s cheese to it that um it's 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 so bad like when you're looking at it critically but i can see why it's it's an easy thing to watch so i can see why some people would say oh this is a guilty pleasure like this is probably the level some of our guilty pleasures Truly, are at i you acknowledge know? that yes so I, I i have to i have to give that to the people who uh do actually enjoy this film because i can see why they enjoy it um i don't think this is one that i would um gravitate to again um I guess I can say I'm glad to have checked it off the list. I've always been curious about. I, I I've read the book by Richard Ma- Richard Matheson. I had only seen the most recent version of the film, and I really was disappointed with what they did. I heard that the the previous two weren't that great, but I was still curious about them. So I'm glad to have checked it off my list. Um, and now I can move on to seeing Vincent Price's uh, the, the uh, Last Man on Earth, but. I don't know if I'm that excited about that one either. Yeah, so, I mean, it sort of sullies the... It, it, it's like poop in the pool. <laughs> like a duty? It's a duty. It's not it's that... Not a I, duty? It's not that bad. I, I mean, I've seen movies that are so bad, it's just like pains me to watch them. Now, this definitely can be painful, but in a way that at least made me chuckle because the cheese level was so high and just like the Charlton Heston one-liners were just so like, uh, I don't know, it just, they made me laugh. So I I enjoyed it in the sense that it was eye-rollingly bad. <laughs> yes. Yes, it was. And maybe I watched it in a, at, at a point when I am, where I was not, um, I, I was not in the right space for eye-rollingly bad. I think that this is an example of expectations. You know, we, We've talked about expectations and the the plague of expectations around Now You See Me. Uh, I expected something. I didn't get it. And as a result, I didn't like the movie very much. When I went back and watched it again, knowing what I was going to get, it was it was much easier to, to stomach. It wasn't great, but I had a better time. This movie, I, uh, w- given the bar, where the bar is set for me for disease movies and as, as, as far as the 
general classification of, you know, Civilization Falls Apart movies. Uh, I expected something better. I expected to connect with it more immediately. I did not connect with it immediately. I am, I am absolutely agitated by Charlton Heston at this point. Like, I can't watch a Charlton Heston movie, and I'm, it, I, it is a result of this film. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, I had a really negative. It's like a, it, it's like an a, allergic reaction to this movie. That's that's Sounds where like I am. It. Yeah. So I mean, I'm glad I didn't have that reaction because at least I can say, you know what, it wasn't my favorite experience in in cinema. And it's a it's a bad movie, but at least I can say it's it's a bad that I enjoyed still. You know, it's that bad enjoyment sort of. So I I'm I'm just no I I will not probably be turning into a guilty pleasure sort of person though. No, please. Another thing that just is is worth noting about this film and just something that I guess you can say is kind of important is it does have an interracial kiss that um, I guess at the time, I mean, there had been interracial kisses in cinema before. It looks like the first one was in 1957 with Island in the Sun and as early as 1959 on TV with Hot Summer Night, but it wasn't common. And so I think that the fact that Charlton Heston uh, kind of lays a big one on Rosalind Cash. I think that was kind of, uh, you know, something worth talking about at the time. Is it worth us talking about it now? You know, just the fact that they did it. And I don't know if you watched Whoopi Goldberg when she had Charlton Heston on her talk show back in the 90s, um, but Charlton Heston lays a big one on her. <laughs> <laughs> and the best part about that is that Whoopi Goldberg goes from being a talk show host to a giddy little schoolgirl having her like one of her movie star idols give her a kiss, and it was really adorable. <laughs> it was really adorable. That's awesome. I actually haven't seen yeah. that. Did we? Did I, you well, put the link in the show notes. Yeah, it's in the show notes. All yeah, right. that's good. So that was cute. That's worth talking about. That is worth talking. I'd about. like to transition into a full review of Whoopi Goldberg's talk show. <laughs> so that was that was a big deal. Uh, John William Corrington and Joyce Hooper Corrington, uh, husband and wife team. Yes. Took on the adaptation uh, of the 54 novel, I Am Legend. What is redeeming to you about the script? Well, I, here's the thing that that bothers me about what they did with this script. She was a, uh, she had a PhD in chemistry. He had a PhD in poetry. As the chemist of the family, she kind of felt like this whole vampire story element was kind of dumb and was trying to find something a little more prevalent to current society. And so she said, oh, well, let's make it this biological warfare that causes this disease. And by doing that, it takes out the whole vampire element and it just, it, it takes out so much of the, you know, where the movie goes and kind of the whole idea of the story. It really kind of the message of the film or message of the book kind of gets lost as they, as they re repurposed it to be timely. Um, and, uh, you know, she was, like I said, the chemist, he was the poet. They wanted to give Neville kind of these two sides. And so they kind of wrote him with that in mind where he was a little, you know, kind of had some artsy elements to him and also had some scientific elements to him. Um, I guess I can see, you know, what they were trying to do with it. I just was really, uh, I don't know. I was really disappointed overall with the script and with the fact that they felt they had to change it in this way. You know, a lot of different things, you know, they, um, the vampires are now these like albino creatures, which is like, okay, so what are these guys feasting on? Well, I mean, what do they, how do they feed? How do they survive? Um, what is this other plague? I mean, Neville walks into this room and he finds a dead one at a table and he's just like, oh, you know, he's died from the plague or whatever. Yeah. What was and that? Like, it's like, so they have their own plague now, or is this the same plague and now it's killing them? Like, that's a story point that kind of never goes anywhere. Um, you, you get t a ton of story from the albinos side of things. I'm just calling them the albinos because I really have no idea what they are. They're not vampires. So who no. knows? They're um, hip. It, they're hipsters. They're, they're like, yeah, they're, you know, anti-technology uh, hippies. Yeah. That's what they are. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's like I, I didn't uh, – that's something I enjoyed so much in the book is that you don't really get that side of the vampires. You know, you kind of get it all from his perspective, which was so great. And then, um, of course, the woman joins him at some point and, and just that – the way the story goes I think is really interesting. Um, you know, they, they go into kind of some mental is mental health issues with him as far as like the phones all ringing. It's like, did, is there, I, I don't know. It's just like, they threw things in there like that. And it's just like, 
I, I don't feel like they really ended up going anywhere with things that they brought in. They like had all these different setups, but they never did gave us any payoffs for any of them. Exactly. Exactly. It was it it was unrequited. Uh, I feel like they they built up a a huge uh, sort of stash of of goodwill just in the opening sequence, right? Because I am intrigued by the opening sequence as a viewer. I am intrigued by him speeding down this empty town or this empty city. Like I really, I'm into it. I, you don't have to you don't have to do much, uh, and I'm into it. And and then they completely lose me by giving me the other side by by telling me a story that these people have a point of view. And, and that's what I don't want. This is a story about the last man on Earth trying to survive. It is not about these mindless creatures having minds and having a civilization and having a religion and having a... It is not about that. It is, that is, is... They absolutely sucked the meaning and the intent out of the property, and that made me so mad. The um, yeah, it, it really it really kind of ruins so much of that uh, that point of the story and the fact that you know this is this this guy who's living by himself in L.A. He's the last man on earth, and then all of a sudden we say, oh, he's not really the last man on earth. That's another story element that they changed that really disappointed me. I mean, I like how they do it in the book, how Richard uh, Matheson chose to kind of address that the woman who shows up and and the way that that story progresses. Here it's like. They're all hunting in the same city and stuff. He's driving around like a maniac all the time, but no, like they never hear. I mean, I, I, my hunch is that if a car was screeching around in, in the city and nothing else is moving anywhere in LA that you could probably hear that car for miles and miles away. Absolutely. And the fact that these people never bump into each other, uh, it just, it just is so strange. And I don't know, it just kind of, irked me that uh, they chose to do this with these people and um and then you know they go and rescue him out of the stadium when he gets caught and it's like you know the the escape is so nonsensical like the way they go about it and and just problems abound everywhere problems abound but they're they're fairly easy to to track down how they how they came about, right? I lay all of this well I lay some of it on the script. It it's absolutely bears some of the responsibility of this. That script, in the hands of Boris Segal, a guy who spent his career developing, directing uh, properties for television, made this the perfect Saturday you know, afternoon or overnight television movie. Like, it should not have been a movie. And coming at it with that expectation, I probably would have liked it a lot more. It had the look of TV. It felt like a bad episode of of Airwolf. Yes, there were bad episodes of Airwolf. <laughs> uh, and and it, it, it lived, it just set the bar low and lived down to it uh, in, in terms of just how it hit me. The Corringtons... Um... They, uh, I mean, they did have, they wrote five screenplays, Von Richthofen and Brown, The Omega Man, Boxcar Bertha, first Scorsese, The Arena, and Battle for the Planet of the Apes, um, plus a TV film, The Killer Bees. So, um, you know, their their screenplay uh, library isn't huge, but I think what's interesting is in the late 70s, they actually uh, um, became head writers for a bunch of daytime serials. And worked on things like General Hospital, and uh, I, I think there's something about the the writing level in the daytime serials, just kind of that soap operatic writing that fits with kind of what we get here, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what we get. And so I have a hard time um, watching this film without that lens. Like I'm I'm watching it and I'm trying to put myself in the in the position of uh, going to see this movie in. 1971, right? And uh, trying to take the the part of me that sees this just as a dated throwback out of the picture. Uh, could this have been an interesting and compelling property in 1971? I have a hard time seeing it as that um, because it feels so much like even television of the time. Yeah. Um, it doesn't feel like it's stretched for anything. It feels like it wears its lessons way too heavily on its sleeves. And, uh, and it puts in these starring positions, um, you know, actors who were, who just were not able to sell it. I think, you know, we talk about world building quite a bit. They build this world 
Um, I mean, it's not horribly built. I, I think there are elements that work. I mean, I, I particularly enjoy some of the wide shots of L.A. where nothing is uh, around. And it's like, <laughs> except it's where nice there is. Did actually, you notice well, that? Well, I, I didn't actually <laughs> notice. There's but a giant I did. truck on a highway in the distance. Right, like right. you just had to pull out just not quite as much. Right, Ugh. exactly. There, there are things that they didn't do quite well, but I, I mean, I think for the most part, they they kind of create their world in the context of the film. That being said, I don't think it's a world that they they set up the rules well. They break all the rules that Matheson already created for the book. They were good they, rules. That were good rules, and they cr- they create their own rules with this whole biological warfare and. They're just, they're dumb rules. They just, you know, it just ends up being meh. It is. Uh, if you want to set up your own rules in an apocalypse scenario, write your own movie. Exactly. Exactly. Um, have you seen any other Boris Segal films? No. I mean, it's, uh, I know he's done lots and lots of TV, not so much, uh, not so much uh, film. I mean, his film. Uh, list is relatively small compared to his TV list. Yeah, I mean, of his 99 credits, uh, nine of them are feature films, and this was his second to last. Um, uh, w- his last film was Angela, starring Sophia Loren, Steve Railsback, and John Huston. His story, I, I you know, he's Katie Segal's dad, um, yeah. so that's that's something. But his story of how he died... I found really horrible and haunting, and so I have to read this passage from IMDb. Um, He was killed uh, early in the production of the TV film World War (laughs) III, obviously his last film, uh, in 1982, in a helicopter accident in Oregon. He had just returned from filming aerial shots, his helicopter landing in the parking lot of the Timberline Lodge on Mount Hood, the exterior's location from The Shining. Preoccupied with his work, he inadvertently turned the wrong way upon getting out of the helicopter, walking directly into the rear rotor blade. He died of severe head and shoulder injuries after emergency surgery 60 miles away in Portland. Astonishingly, filming resumed the very next day with a new director. The other thing to note about that, which is crazy to me in terms of coincidence unrelated to this film, he did. Uh, he worked on the pilot of Combat 1962 with Vic Morrow. Vic Morrow died the same way do you remember this this was well yeah it was uh um twilight zone right? twilight zone the movie 1983 20 years later within a Ugh. year of each other and they they had worked together 20 years earlier on combat exclamation point 1962 is that crazy that just doesn't happen that's just horrifying that happens in raiders of the lost ark that's where that happens I don't know. It's just so shocking that uh, that really it's just such a shocking way to go. You know, Ugh. I don't know. It just is really horrifying. It's just awful. And so clearly a tragic way to die. I think it's amazing that they were able to pick up World War Three the next day and, and get that thing going and end up directing. It was uh, David Green that stepped in yeah. um, to that particular project i don't see that um in in twilight zone when that uh with that accident he didn't walk into the rotor so at least it wasn't quite the same but he did get decapitated by the rotor that one the pyrotechnics Ugh. actually caused the plane the helicopter to crash on top of him and two other people um and it killed them instantly but yes the the rear rotor did decapitate him still horrifying just horrifying Let's try first shot, last shot. What do you get out of the first shot, last shot of this film, Andy? Let's um, first. Speaking of first shot, I have to say with the with the logo for Warner Brothers. <laughs> yes, man, I love this logo for Warner Brothers. It's like I, I don't know. It's not a logo that you really see, and it's just. I have not seen it for any other Warner Brothers film I've ever seen. And what was it? Some leisure something production. What did it say on the band? That's what I was trying to remember. I'm like, have I seen this logo before? Because it it certainly wasn't familiar. Um, it was uh, colorful. I'm trying to actually find it right now. I'm scrubbing through the the beginning of the film, trying to see Me if too. I can pin it down again. Um, but uh, it was just it just had such a different feel. A Kinney Leisure Service, WB, a Kinney Leisure Service. <laughs> Kinney, 1916. During 90 years, the Warner Brothers Shield has undergone a series of refinements. Three variations reflect transitions in ownership. Warner Brothers Seven Arts in 1967, 
Kinney in 1969 and Warner Communications in 1972. So this was before Warner Communications. So it's, yeah, it's that small window of 69 to 72. Anyhow, so the first shot of the film is, uh, well, that's not the first shot is the, the Kinney logo. The, the first shot is the, uh, the wide shot on the uh, L.A. streets, empty L.A. streets, right? And uh, Neville, our Heston hero, is uh, he's taking a drive. I, I imagine this is what Charlton Hess look, looks like all the time, <laughs> when he's, even when he's not in the movie. I feel like every time I see him, he's wearing this sort of a safari shirt with a gun belt around it and, and the cool, cool shades. shades. Yeah. Right, driving so, his red convertible. Driving his red convertible. <laughs> yeah, he's driving like, a, like, you know, he's in a car chase. And then, of course, we get a great zoom in on him. Um, and then I, I don't, it sets up the film nicely, I guess. You know, this, you know, this guy driving crazy in the streets of L.A., it seems like there's something going on, but then you realize there's no one chasing him. It's nice and quiet. And then as soon as he parks, he stops the car, pulls out a machine gun and like blasts away at a shadow, like moving in a window. It was like, it was actually a pretty interesting way to start the film. And I enjoyed the start of the film. It, it kind of sets up this world in an interesting way. It piques my curiosity. It draws me in. And it, it, it kind of gave me a sense of where things could potentially go. It just didn't go there. Yes, and and on those points, Andy, I agree with you. I had not uh, discovered my newfound revulsion of Charlton Heston at this point. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was interesting that these things. It was still obviously daytime and fascinating that they were moving around. That's a that's a a thing that I that was new to me. The, so here are these creatures that they've introduced that are hiding. They're clearly hiding in the dark, but they are moving around. Uh, although, how does he see the shadow if they're not you know backlit somehow? Uh, in the in the building, so they're clearly not that you know frustrated by light, you know. I, but at this point, I still was expecting vampires. Well, yeah, because it's like creepy shadows moving in the building. It's like, yeah. oh, it seems like it could be potentially a vampire or yes, something. Yeah. Right? It has maybe that it's feel. late in the day. It kind of has that feel. Yes, and he whips out the gun and starts shooting at him, which actually ties nicely to when he actually meets the rest of the people who reflect back to him that they had to lie low because he drives around town shooting at buildings. <laughs> And that was a laugh out loud moment because, again, not to belabor the point, I feel like that's Charlton Heston every day. Uh, right. <laughs> Just I just, driving around as, town shooting at buildings. As soon as he did that, I, I, instantly my brain went to, out of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, it's like so. he's got that moment and Eastwood has the, the chair The moment. chair. Those are theirs to <laughs> cherish. Oh dear, oh dear. So that's how the film opens, is is this wide, empty street. So we get that feeling of desolation, we get that feeling of... Uh, it, it, it's not quite desolation yet, it's abandonment. I mean, it really looks like everybody just left the place. I think they did a, a fine job on that initial street scene of of demonstrating the city as being gone. Yeah, and then, and then the film ends with uh, Neville dead in the fountain, um, in a cru- very much in a uh, crucifixion pose. Uh, right, much like Jesus, and he's uh, been shot by the arrow, and he's bleeding into the water, and the whole fountain is just red, as he just lays there dead in the fountain, and uh, that's the final film. It's a, it's as if his blood, you know, he's given his pure, uninfected blood to, uh, to his team, uh, to Dutch, and uh, to hopefully help. Uh, Rosalind Cash and all these kids and any other humans that they might find, and then maybe potentially the family too. Who knows? But but his blood. I mean, you're talking about the blood that they pick up in a jar from inside the bloody fountain. Well, no, he had it in his coat. He had yeah, taken right. that, and it was in his coat, and he gave it to Dutch as yeah. he was about to die. Right. Right. But there so is that's... also this like blood in the water thing. It was a very kind of a forced symbolic way to say you know this is the savior of humankind and it just it felt like uh just a really cheesy sort of thing and i I don't know i just (laughs) (laughs) i was trying to make sense of this pairing and i feel like i i am being way too gracious when i tell you the following the opening scene is him sort of dominating the city it's his he runs the city right he's the boss he is he is the caretaker of the city and because he's the only one in it that is lucid according to him 
right? Yep. We, do we agree so far? We agree. The final scene, he's gone through, let's say we agreed that he went through a cathartic journey uh, with the relationships with the, these other people that he discovers actually live in the city, both the family and the and the kids. And the final scene, he uh, lays his, his his soul bare, sort of the the blood and the body uh, bear in the fountain uh, as a way to demonstrate his ultimate martyrdom and cement his role as the savior of the city in death. I stand Very down. nice. What do you think? Very nice. Yes. I mean, I'm, j- I'm really pulling that from some dark places because I did not like this movie and I don't genuinely believe that, that they were intending that <laughs> as, to be the case, but... But if if you were to build some sort of a symbolic case, that's that might be where you begin. Well, they named him the Omega Man. I mean, that's the name that these uh, this uh, pair chose to name their script. They didn't call it "I Am Legend." They called it the Omega Man, and you know that kind of almost ties to Christianity. And it you know a nickname of Jesus. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And uh, it's just one of those things where it's like, it's like the beginning and the end, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'm not really sure what they're saying other than this is the guy who is kind of like, he's not the end of everything, but it's almost like, I mean, he is kind of like the beginning of of saving humankind and the end potentially of these Of redeeming creatures. it. That is, he is redemption. He is salvation, and he is redemption. And that is what that is what I I feel like they are heavy handedly, uh, you know, pawing at me to see. It's all in the name, and it's all in the first and the last shot. There you go. Once again, this is why we do that first shot, last shot, Andy. That's genius, even on a crummy movie. <laughs> well played, sir. The about thing the- about a movie is that people spend a lot of time making them, and so they have plenty of time to think about these sorts of things and. <laughs> And even in a crummy movie, it's uh, yeah. There's there is some thought that does have to go into the choices that they make. You are the alpha and the omega. You are my <laughs> omega. Let's talk about the cast. Do you I, really? Uh, should we? I mean, I uh, Charlton Heston. We've talked already. I feel like about him. I just you know he really is the king of expository monologuing. You know the whole first part, the first act of the film when he's alone. Um, other than when he's fighting off the family. I mean, he is just talking to himself left and right. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I don't know how else you're going to do it, you know, but uh, it's just, man, it just, I don't know. I kept laughing because he's just is, there's something about the way he does it that is just so cheesy and it uh, it doesn't work, but it still made me chuckle. So uh, Well, I uh, also chuckled so much that I was texting you, quotes from the movie i was recording the movie as i was watching it i would stop it i would meticulously rewind it and i would record it on my phone and send it to you because i couldn't stop i couldn't stop and and some of the hestonisms were magnified so terrifically by the the rest of the production the foley sound and the music there there's one where he's in the is he in the uh, where is he in the church or the somewhere and and he's he walks in and he does the quintessentially Heston oh my god right <laughs> and then there's a bong after it bong it's so stupid it's so stupid it renders the entire sequence uh completely um uh neutered i made a note about sound effects i'm like what is up with the sound effects They're terrible in this film? They're just uh, terrible. So strange. So, strange. Uh, so it, it, anyway, yes. I mean, he was, and and then of course, when he takes off his shirt, he has to take off his shirt. He is really the ultimate man's man, and it's just it, it was like I saw that. I'm like, of course he's going to do that. I mean, <laughs> isn't it funny how how view of um, sort of that sort of the the sexuality of hunk has changed? Yes. Like you look at Heston in this movie in seventy one, you think, man, that dude's hairy. Right. Like, <laughs> sexy men are not hairy anymore. That has to be <laughs> gone. Uh, right. And then you look at Mitch in Paranorman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So he funny. he was uh, the model anyway. So pretty terrible. What do you want to talk about? Is the the stunt man? This is that period where when a stunt man is in there. 
sometimes you just really can tell. And his stuntman, when when he's racing around on the motorcycle, it just was so obvious to me. Like every time you'd cut to the, kind of the wide shot of his um, of the of him on the motorcycle, Neville on the motorcycle, racing around or jumping over a car or whatever. And it's just like the hair is just, it's so obviously not Heston. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> could they have tried maybe a little bit more? I don't know. But... <laughs> yeah, I don't think they could have. Yeah. No. Anyway. Uh, Anthony Zerbe is Matthias. Oh, gosh, man. He's one of those actors who's just, he's in everything. I mean, we've talked about him in Dead Zone, uh, or at least we talked about Dead Zone, and he was in that. He was in License to Kill. He was in the last two of the Matrix movies, Papillon, American Hustle. He's one of those actors who's just, you know, he's a character actor. He pops up all over the place, and it's nice to see him here in this film. (laughs) No, I mean, it's nice to see him, I was going to say, in this film where it's like, I I don't think that it was... um, there was uh it wasn't necessarily a great role for him or anything, but I mean still I enjoyed watching him. Let me just ask you, how much of the Omega Man do you think has has persisted into his reel? <laughs> I just wanted to see what what he thought. As a professional in the industry. I hear what you're saying. Your silence speaks volumes. I actually couldn't get over how much he looks like Stuart Wilson. He was in uh, Lethal Weapon 3. He was the bad guy in Lethal Weapon 3. But he's been in a lot of other stuff. Like, you would totally recognize him. He's a quintessential bad guy. And he looks exactly like Anthony Zerby to me. Exactly. That's funny. I think they look similar, but I don't think they, like, you said that. I was like, oh, I guess I can see it. Oh, but, man. Yeah. yeah, Stuart Wilson was in uh, Hot Fuzz. Yes, Exactly. Anthony Zerby, I just wanted to say that he did make his actual screen debut with Charlton Heston as one of uh, the cowhands in 1967's Will Penny. Uh, so it did make me wonder if um, if Heston was like, hey, get that, uh, bring on over Anthony Zerby. I will not work if it's not with Anthony Zerby. Just like that. It's terrible. It was pretty terrible. Hey, I do the impression he deserves. <laughs> Rosalind Cash. This was her first lead role, and I, uh, you know, she's not an actress that I follow at all. Um, although you should love her, she was in Buckaroo Bonsai. Of course, I love her because of that. <laughs> I love her anyway. Actually, I really do. I think she's really fun, and I'm so disappointed uh, about this movie and her role in it. It was, it was just so bad for her. But I, I think she was, uh, I think she was fine. I think that something I learned from looking at the filmographies of the actors in this is a lot of them ended up doing a lot of TV. Yeah. And I think that that speaks highly to kind of the level. Like you said, with uh, with Seagal's direction here and the writing, it all felt very TV. You know, everything about this kind of had a TV vibe to it. And, uh, you know, and I, I think that, you know, she had a, a strong TV career. I mean, she was in Buckaroo Banzai, like I said, she was in Clute. I, I think that there were elements of her that I still enjoyed in this film. Um, you know, she was, um, the writers wanted to kind of put her in, made her black because of the, the rise of the black power movement at the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, she's just uh, downright sexy in the film. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I like that she was actually, speaking of uh, how Whoopi Goldberg reacted when uh, Charlton Heston gave her a kiss, uh, Cash was really nervous about um, doing the, the scene with Heston because she's like, you know, how do you just get it on with Moses? <laughs> 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 Which it speaks to how people, I, I, Heston said something about how the 70s was a period when for him, it really started hitting him how um how like the later generations were reacting to some of those some of those earlier films of his and he said it was a, actually an interesting time for him which i thought was pretty funny anybody else so the only other person i wanted to mention was eric lanaville who uh who plays our dear um our dear richie yeah our infected who gets saved uh by the blood of of our little jesus figure here uh, you know, he's not, he wasn't really that, you know, anything that stood out for me in the film, except when I started looking him up on uh, IMDb, it's like, wow, this guy really shifted. I mean, again, started doing a lot of TV stuff, but he really shifted into being a director, starting with St. Elsewhere. Uh, he started uh, directing and he's kind of shifted and he acts now and then like he was uh, Dr. Lamar in Scrubs. But I mean, you look at his directing 
career. And it's like, this guy has really done a lot of directing and is still doing a lot of directing. I, you know, back then in the 80s, L.A. Law, Quantum Leap, Doogie Howser, M.D., then like NYPD Blue, E.R., Gilmore Girls, Monk. Well, look at mentalist. today. I mean, Grimm, he's here. He's in my fair city. Yeah, right. Grimm, Lost. I mean, he was directing episodes of Lost, Prison yeah. Break. Yeah. Uh, this is a guy who really went on to direct a lot of really interesting things. And I really was kind of fascinated by that, that... uh you know this uh, this actor who I you know I didn't give much credence to when I watched this ended up being somebody who has directed quite a number of uh, really uh, interesting things. I that may be the highlight of this show, Andy. <laughs> uh, can we let's talk a little bit about getting it made? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is one of those movies that was made um, in the 70s. And so Russell Meddy, who is the cinematographer, used a lot of zoom lenses. Oh, my goodness. Boy, zooming all over the place, weren't they? All over. And, man, uh, just speaking of cheap, uh, my favorite (laughs) note of the cheapness of it is when uh, you have the flashback of Heston um, taking his experimental serum and running to the helicopter. He hops in and they take off. And as the helicopter flies around, you look at the reflections in the window of the helicopter. They never change. The right. tree reflection is always just sitting there. And it's just like, yeah, this is definitely uh, cheap. <laughs> They're doing this on the cheap. So um, that's about the level of it. I don't really have much more to say about the cinematography and really not much else in the uh, in the actual production itself. Did you have anything to say about any of the folks? I really looked at some of the hair and makeup because, you know, it was it was an effort to just make everybody white. And I thought, that's fun, fancy. Who who did that? Yeah, right. And it turns out there are some people who were uh, who, who moved on to some really good things. In fact, the hair, uh, Jean Burt Riley um, was doing this this very work until the day the year she died. She was doing uh, Raging Bull and True Confessions, her last film. So she's, I mean, you you see kind of where they went. You, this definitely feels like where they started. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know, I, I it was it was cheap. It looked cheap. The diseases looked cheap. The the wounds on their faces were sort of dime sc- dime store scar kits. Um, um, and and in some cases that worked. If this was a if this was a movie, I had a greater affinity for. I imagine I would not have noticed those things. Right. Yeah. Right. I noticed exactly. those things. Yeah. You definitely noticed those things. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it was fun. I, I will say I was relatively impressed with the amount of whiteness that they gave to Lincoln, Pat, uh, Kilpatrick. Yes. Uh, Zachary is like, boy, he really was completely just whited out, wasn't he? He was, he was whited out. <laughs> uh, the only other person I really wanted to mention, um, was Ron Grainer who did the music. And I don't want to mention him because he did the music for this film because it didn't really do much for me. It just feels very seventies. But he has but he- a really key credit. He does. He is the guy who wrote the iconic uh, theme song for Doctor Who. That's amazing. That really, uh, I was like, gosh, this guy's stuff is terrible in this film. And then I looked at it, it's like, oh, <laughs> look I at that. Know. Looky, looky. That's fancy. So that was nice to see. It's like there's another little highlight that uh, that I gleaned from this. I almost feel a, a, a well of shame that I'm even asking this question. How did the film do an award season, Andy? Interestingly, it actually did get nominated for an award. I was surprised. <laughs> it was an Image Award. It wasn't an Oscar or anything, but the Image Award nomination for Rosalind Cash for Outstanding Actress in Lead Role, which is interesting because, I mean, I guess you could call it a lead role. I mean, if you call it uh, Anthony Hopkins in... in yes. Uh, Silence of the Lambs. It's it's that whole thing. Yeah. Um. You know the one woman in the film. Sure. Let's. <laughs> she's yeah, an, she's lead. Lead enough. Yeah, but she lost to Jane Fonda in Clute, which is probably for the that best. Was, that was the right call. Yes, it was. Yes, yeah. it was. Uh, we we mentioned a couple of the uh, gaffes that we picked up. For me, it was the wide shot with the traffic in the distance. Um. Uh, Do you notice anything else? Any booms? <laughs> I didn't notice anything else. I just, uh, you know, was kind of, uh, I mean, I will say, as bad as it was, it was just one of those mesmerizingly bad films. <laughs> mesmerizingly bad. I I feel like uh, I, I found myself comparing this movie to my reaction to Escape from New York, which I, I by comparison, I like a lot more. Uh, so I can only hope that the numbers bear out. 
I wish I could give you a ton of information. There's not a lot out there. I mean, it did open August 1st, 1971. Unfortunately, no budgetary information is anywhere that I could find, at least. Um, I did just find that it was relatively low budget, although more than Last Man on Earth. Um, however, domestically at the theaters, it did make $8.7 million at the box office, which is about $50 million. So, you know, assuming that it was, uh, I, I'm guessing it was made for less than $8 million since it was such a low budget. So I'm guessing it made its money back, but I just don't have any information. All right. Well, what are you going to do? I think we're, we're going to rank it. I think that is what we're going to do. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and get ready for this. Filmo a Filmo, the Omega Man. We're going to rank it against every film on our list so far. You know the drill. But uh, here's the thing I'm most interested in is where are you and I going to go to the mat on this one? They, this has, a uh, uh, in my book, just as... Uh, you were so keen on Dr. Strangelove last week, uh, moving straight to the top. This is a rush class film for me, and I I am really <laughs> curious where we're going to end up uh, parting ways. I am too. All right. Well, let's find out. First up, we have The Omega Man, or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh Brother. Yes, indeed. The Omega Man or The Sandlot? Sandlot. Definitely Sandlot. The Omega Man or The Hudsucker Proxy? Hudsucker Proxy. I, I would pick Hot Sucker Proxy. <laughs> That's not where we are going to split. All right. <laughs> the Omega Man or Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. All right. If it's going to happen, it's going to start to get difficult for you here. I am very clearly Indiana Jones and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I am too. Ooh. We haven't quite got to that point. The Omega Man or Apt Pupil. Apt Pupil. I actually am thinking this might be the point. I'm I, I'm gonna have to think about this because uh, no, I'm not. It's not. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a good film. But it's not a good film. But it's better than this. The Omega Man or Rush. I am. I'm going to say the Omega Man because at least I can laugh and enjoy myself watching this film. I am too. Hey, look yeah, at that! I know. Oh, uh, this is a this is a fitting comparison. The Omega Man or Children of the Corn. I'm saying the Omega Man. I'm saying the Omega Man. I really did not like Children of the Corn. No, it was pretty terrible. That was awful. <laughs> the Omega Man or the Last Boy Scout. Last Boy Scout. Uh, I guess so. I guess I'm going to say the Last Boy Scout. Yeah. It does have that pretty stellar football uh, game at the beginning. Yeah. Well, that leaves the kickoff to our disease film uh series starts at 244 starts, starts with a bit of a whimper it can only go up from here that's i i have to believe I, that <laughs> please, please let it go up from here <laughs> oh 244 oh. yeah that was a rough one and so what's what's below it now uh below it we have children of the corn scoop rush under the cherry moon the women Remember, we do have a new bottom. It's the women. <laughs> You're right. The women was horrifically bad. <laughs> oh, yes. And it it fits way down there. So. Yeah. Oh, you know, I had forgotten that because I, I have cemented uh, Rush as the worst film I've ever seen for so long that I, I, <laughs> I need to change my belief system. What does this do for your letterbox? I imagine there's a half involved somewhere. There isn't. Oh, really? There is not. I mean, there is, technically, uh, if you look at it as it's made of four halves. I actually gave it two stars. Um, I I think that it's a pretty terrible film, but I gave it two because I'm like, I could still watch this and enjoy it. This isn't a, this isn't a bad film that I just could not watch again. I don't I don't like swimming in the ocean, Andy. Um, I, I tend to be one of those people. Like I like swimming, but I don't like going to the ocean. You put me on a deserted island with Rush or the women and this movie, and I would go for a swim. <laughs> this is this is very much... Can you be a half-star movie? You can. I'm a half-star on this. Sounds good. Terrible. Not a good place to start the series. All right. I, actually, now I, do say, I will say I really want to go watch The Last Man on Earth. To see, like, where does that fall for me with these three films, these three adaptations? I'm watching I Am Legend tonight because I think you haters, I I think you don't remember that it has some redeeming qualities. That's my sense. I will say, I really enjoyed all the stuff with Neville in that film before the the really dumb vampires were introduced. Yeah, there's some really dumb vampires. All right, where where do we go from here? 
Uh, we're going to be continuing our disease uh, series, hopefully with a better film. We're going to be looking at The Andromeda Strain. Now, have you seen this movie? I have seen this movie. It's been a long time for me. but I What I do know is uh, I really liked the, the book, the Crichton book. Yeah. And so I don't remember the movie all that much. I read the book after I saw the movie. And so that has kind of supplanted my memory of it. I saw this sometime in the last uh, 10 years, I think, for the first time. And I thought it was pretty interesting. I didn't love it, but I am curious to revisit it. Um, did you ever see the remake that, that they did in, you know, was the, it 08? 2008, yeah, yeah. You know, I saw a little piece of it. I, I did, haven't seen the whole thing. And I, it wasn't really compelled to see the whole thing. Yeah. I'm curious about uh, about seeing the Andromeda Strain again because I think that uh, you know Robert Wise, uh, director, he's done some really interesting things, some things that are important to me, even if they're not oh, great yes. films. And so, uh, and and some of them are really, really great films. And so I'm I'm fascinated to see how he handles this particular uh, property. That's where I am. Can't wait. Until then, I'm going to bed. All right, I'm going to go watch the trailer for Storks again. <laughs> Amazon giveth, Andy. As the, Amazon always doeth. This, I, I, uh, I think we both went with a little bit of a different direction uh, here. Uh, because this is such a terrible movie, of course, we have to go for the five star reviews, and I think that uh, that these are um, these are fine. Mine comes <laughs> from uh, Amazon customer, and uh, this is a five star. Yes, I'll have some serious wine with my cheese, and wine is humorously spelled W H I N E. Amazon you think customer. they did that on purpose? Do you think? I don't know. They capitalized it, so that, that screams intent. Literally screams <laughs> intent. He says, okay, I grew up in the 70s. I saw this movie on the living room console TV on Friday night when it was movie of the week. And as a kid, I thought this movie was the bee's knees. But how time changes. Oh, Lord, this movie is bad. I mean bad, as in I'd say it was cheesy, but that would be offensive to every cheesy movie ever made. Heston must have lost a bet. But, you know, it's so bad, so cheesy, trying so hard to be hip and cool to appeal to the kids out there, those crazy mod kids, the hippies with their free love and dropping the pot and protesting President Nixon, that you have to watch it. It's mandatory. It's maudlin awfulness reflects the times. Two very distinct cultures separated by a generation chasm. But anyway, you must go watch The Omega Man. Watch it for the absurdly laughable cheap costumes. Watch it for the awkward goofball choreographed fights. Watch it for the hippie love peace children are pure message. Watch it with bell-bottom jeans on and a lava lamp on the coffee table and say, be cool, and the man is keeping me down at least five times apiece. And remember, when you're infected and dying and become evil, wait for it, just wait for it already. You become strangely religious hate technology you're repulsed by art and you turn white <laughs> <laughs> not bad amazon customer pretty good i pretty like it d good pretty good well i've got another five star um that uh, by larry g boyle who says moses saves mankind again what can I say? Charlton Heston's classic film, he should have put classic in quotes, where he survives a biological war that kills off everyone in the world except him, immune due to an experimental drug he injected himself with, and an insane group of people slowly dying from the bioweapon known as the family, whose main intent is to kill off Heston and therefore cleanse the world of mankind's tools of destruction. Anthony Zerby is a big anchor man on the evening news who becomes infected in the head of the family. Rosalind Cash and friends, mostly still children, actually end up rescuing him from not only the family, but his slowly disintegrating sanity. Famous for the kiss between Heston and Cash, which was a big deal in this early 70s film. And we all know how Heston fares by now. The Christ on the cross symbolism that ends the film. My favorite Heston film of all time, but then I first saw it as a kid in the 70s when it was released as a 
at a Saturday mat- afternoon matinee at our local theater. Anyone remember those? This should be a must to have in your VHS slash DVD slash Blu-ray collection. Yes, I have all three versions. Yeesh. Popcorn and hot tamale candies. Get some and enjoy the end of the world. My God. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. Oh, it's um, good, not not good times. Um, oh, I know it. It's uh, do 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 uh, what is it? I think it's I soap. I totally know what it is. I think it's you think soap. You it's soap? Yeah. I, uh, why do I feel that's incorrect? I don't actually know. I've just had it in my head all day. I'm going to uh, check it out. I'm checking it out. I'm going to I'm gonna check it out right now, real time. Are you going to use nope, that? Nope, it's uh, not soap. That's, yeah, it's different. It's not soap. Is it good times? No, it's not good times. Yeah, this is great da, 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 podcasting. Ba da da da, ba da da da, ba da 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 da. Yeah, I got nothing. Good song though. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, I know. You're telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. In Season 6, our Disease Films series had adaptations like The Omega Man, based on I Am Legend, The Andromeda Strain, Children of Men, and Blindness. I Am Legend is so much better than The Omega Man. What about the Will Smith version? Don't get me started. For our This Is Real Life Jack series, we talked Black Hawk Down and Seabiscuit, some great true stories based on fantastic books. And we had more listeners' choices, like The Fly, The Emigrants, and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. You just did a series on The Fly on the Sitting in the Dark podcast. Did you read the original material? Wasn't watching every Fly movie enough? <laughs> our Big Betty Davis series featured adaptations like The Little Foxes, Now Voyager, All About Eve, and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Are you calling Betty Davis big? Only in personality and force. She is a force to be reckoned with. (laughs) We talked about the entire The Godfather trilogy, of course. Iconic page to screen, even if it is just the one Mario Puzo book. I wonder if Coppola will ever make The Sicilian. We also had some Zhang Yimou adaptations with Judo and Raise the Red Lantern. Absolutely gorgeous movies. And don't forget the Hughes Brothers series with From Hell, based on the graphic novel. Brilliant material. Kelly Reichardt gave us Wendy and Lucy and Certain Women, adapted from short stories. Plus more Hayao Miyazaki as we tackled Howl's Moving Castle. Find all these books and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the show. Get the full list of adapted films that we've covered at thenextreel.com slash originals and start your next read today. Mm-hmm.